fantastic. Um, it's really nice to be here. And I kind of thought, well, it's a school night, so we could do a little bit of uh, pain, a little bit of pleasure, a few drugs, and a few f fruit flies will turn up now and again. I kind of thought I'd talk to you about how you, we can change the brain, how our functions alter as we are bombarded with sensory events from the outside world. Now, can we get this to move? Yeah. So this is just about the problem of pain. You don't have to read the numbers, but pain is a huge medical problem. It changes the way our nervous system functions, and that is kind of shown here. So here you all are with 50 billion neurons in your brains, and as time goes on, we lose neurons. I've probably lost a lot more than you guys, but these neurons allow us to have all our kind of emotions, our thoughts, and these circuits make us into these incredibly unique individual people that we are. And as you're kind of sitting here, hopefully most of the stimuli you're getting from the outside world are hearing, vision, touch, and temperature. So those things come along, and everything's OK, and then suddenly pain arrives. And pain has got this remarkable ability to kind of like take over the function of our brain. Our brains can't deal with our emotions and our hopes and our fears, and they're disrupted. So why is that the case? The issue is that 15% of the population are in this state. Normal brain functions, all our kind of emotions and our everyday lives are disrupted by this incoming stimulus. So what's going on? Well, we have evolved an incredible number of beautifully selective sensors arranged all over our body. So we can tell exactly what's happened to us. If the person next to you fondles your earlobe, you know it. If they stick a pin in you, you will know it. If an ant or a scorpion bites you during the performance, you will know it. And those inputs arrive in the spinal cord, and the spinal cord brings everything together and sends a message up to the brain. And the new part of the brain, the cortex, has this remarkable map of the body. And that's the homunculus. These are the parts of the body that the brain is most interested in. It's hands, it's face, and for males, other parts much less interest by the brain. But that's one part of the story. The other one is an input into what we call the limbic brain. This is this ancient part of the brain where all our kind of emotional states, our fears, our hopes for the future are there. And if this is going to be bombarded by pain, clearly it's not able to function normally. And that's the problem. And then we have the top part of the brain is able to talk back to the spinal cord. So if we're fearful and anxious and not sleeping well, our pain can get worse. The brain makes pain up, up to a higher level. If we're coping and distracting, we can switch pain off. And it's a bit like the internet. It's a perpetual talking of all these neuronal systems. So unlike all our, well, like our other sensations, like hearing, like touch, like taste, there's a threshold, there's an intensity and a location. But pain has these psychological aspects. It's not pleasant. Some people are into pain and pleasure, and that's a kind of different story altogether that we don't really understand. But for most patients who have pain, they have these problems together with the fact that it's hard to go out and have fun if you've got pain and your mood is down, you might lose your job, etc. So we're going to look at those pathways and see what happens. So we have this kind of vicious relationship between pain, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances. And so in every single patient with pain, quality of life goes downhill. Now, down here we have some brain transmitters, dopamine, noradrenaline, and 5-HT. And these guys are controlling these kind of higher functions of the brain. They're important in anxiety and sleep. Um, depression, etc., and pain changes the way they function. So what we've got is periphery, where we sense pain somewhere in our body, spinal cord, up to the brain, and here, as unique human beings, we build up an experience and we describe our pain. There's no objective way we can look inside here and know how much pain or suffering somebody's got. We have to rely on what people tell us. 
and then the pathways come down again. So let's start out here in the periphery, how we know what's going on in the outside world. And we have these sensors. Now, they're called trip channels, and that's of no great importance whatsoever. But it's this beautiful fine line between pain and pleasure and, in fact, molecular gastronomy. Because the human heat pain sensor, called trip V1, is activated by chili. So the reason you have a burning sensation in your mouth if your chili's got too much capsaicin in, or your goulash or whatever, is because that chemical hijacks the heat pain receptor. The cold pain receptor is activated by mint. That's why it's got a cooling sensation. And this is an irritant sensor. This is, if you ever get tear gas, this is why tear gas is unpleasant. But rather nicer things, horseradish, cinnamon, and garlic can activate these sensors. So we have evolved these from fruit flies, these ancient little things that buzz around your fruit bowls in the summer. They started these sensors. They need to know about their outside worlds. And we have remarkably similar sensors that we use to sense pain. In fact, there's a fruit fly just went past then. Um, too much cold, too much heat, too many irritants. And we'll, we'll come back to these at the end. So things come into the spinal cord. And we have nerve cells in the spinal cord receiving all these sensory inputs. And if you repeatedly make some facetious comment to somebody you know, what happens? And you repeat it, you wind them up. And that's what the neurons do. If they repeatedly get a painful message, they increase their excitability. And there's really similar mechanisms to this which enable us in other parts of our brain to remember things. You know, if you're revising for an exam, the more you repeat it, the more you remember it. Painful inputs get remembered by these sensory cells. So all of a sudden, if pain goes on, the messages up to the brain are amplified by these processes. And there's a drug that will block these, and that's ketamine. Patients don't like the side effects of this drug. You feel dissociated from the world, you have cognitive and other changes, but ketamine turned up on the streets about seven or eight years ago as an alternative to ecstasy. So a drug that can work in patients, and they don't like the side effects, those um, psychological affective dissociative effects are sought after on the street. So we can suddenly see how pain drives a system that uses neural networks, but drugs from the outside can alter it as well. So. We're still down here in the spinal cord. We have the up escalator to the emotional and sensory parts of the brain, and then activity comes down again. So here's me, career slowly going downhill with time, <coughs> messages coming back from the brain. And those three mood, reward, pleasure transmitters are in these pathways. So pain changes the way they function. And these pathways, they can make pain worse, or they can make it better. So it's kind of like good cop, bad cop, sitting up in the brain, monitoring these inputs, and depending on how we are as an individual, and as time goes by, can switch things up and down. So are they important? Here's a great example of how the good cop, this brain imaging, those little brainstem areas activated, inhibiting the spinal cord, and this has all been kicked off by placebo. So you give people an inert tablet, what they expect, a little bit of reward, a bit of reinforcement. It reduces pain, and it uses those descending pathways to switch it off. So here's a great example of something that hasn't even got a pharmacological action, able to interact and hijack those brain circuits and make pain better. And placebo is really intriguing because the bigger the tablet or the pill, the bigger the effect is. If you inject people, it's even better as well. And if you inject into a kind of bony bit, it's best of all. But <laughs> placebo changes the way our brain functions. It's an external event. It's what we hope and what we expect, and it triggers changes. So whilst on pain, we have a bit more pharmacology, we have the opium poppy. And the opium poppy contains morphine and codeine. 
And if you asked kind of most people in the street, like, you know, what drug do you think is the most valuable, the most useful, probably most people would say morphine. It takes pain away. If you've got a terminal cancer, you can live the rest of your life pain-free, hopefully. Traumas, accidents, etc. it works. But heroin is basically juice of the opium poppy, a really simple little chemical reaction. It makes heroin, a white powder that gets into the brain faster than morphine. And when it gets into the brain, the extra bits fall off, and it's morphine quickly in the brain. So heroin does the same as morphine. But of course, the context of that use is completely different. And we know that heroin causes physical, but also psychological changes. So we move on into what we call the reward systems in the brain. And this little nucleus here and this little nucleus here are talking to each other. And it's kind of shown in a bit more complicated way here. But effectively, whatever you like doing, whether you like coming to lost lectures, or you like you know, social networking, or chocolate, or crack cocaine, or anything, these agents are able to drive these reward systems, but it's incredibly variable. So it might be, I wouldn't mind trying that again. It could end up being, I can't do anything without that drug. I need it, and so the drug dominates people's lives as a continuum. So it's kind of interesting, because dopamine is important in some other things, not just reward. Vomiting, if you're kind of interested in that, schizophrenia, and Parkinson's. In Parkinson's disease, the levels of dopamine go down, and people can't move particularly well. And the first sign is that their face becomes impassive. They have difficulty swallowing. If you take speed or amphetamine, it increases dopamine. And so suddenly you can't stop talking or chewing or swap or moving, and it's triggering your reward systems. Equally, in patients with Parkinson's, their dopamine's gone down. You treat them, you elevate dopamine, and despite the fact these are quite elderly people, a number of them take up gambling and compulsive shopping because the therapy that's trying to make them move again has messed up these pathways. So there's this remarkable kind of linking between recreational drugs, clinical disorders, and what these chemicals are doing. So all the drugs that are used recreationally in one way or another can increase reward by increasing this transmitter dopamine. But patients aren't like this. Patients probably get more opioids than people on the streets do. They're purer. They might be treated for longer periods of time. They don't often show drug-seeking behavior. And the reason for this is that pain is unpleasant, and so it switches reward off. So if you take your opioid drug, it can't trigger this. But if you take it on the street, where your reward system is ready and available, then dependence can occur. So there are links between all of these things. So a few extremely tenuous links to, to finish off. Patients need better drugs, so they come along, and the drugs are basically improvements on what we already have. Less side effects, greater effectiveness. Recreational drugs come along, new ones come along, like mephedrone, for example. And this was in The Observer, which comes out on Sunday, as you know, saying four in ten club goers say it was their drug of choice. And originally it was a drug, it's a kind of amphetamine ecstasy-like drug. It wasn't on the Misuse of Drugs Act. When it, became, when it was banned, it became more popular. Now, on Monday in The Guardian, Mix Mag, they had a, a survey, the use of this is going down because unlike the better drugs the patients get, for example, street drugs become less pure as time goes on, as people cash in on their popularity. Right, 15% of patients, of, of people, sorry, have pain at this very moment in time. 15% of the people who filled out this survey said that they had used in the last year a white powder that somebody had given them and they didn't even trust that person, but they still took it. So the point is, that's kind of somewhat reckless. But I hope, as you've kind of seen as we've gone along, there are actually similarities. Morphine and heroin are the same thing. And all those recreational drugs you saw a short while back 
They trigger the reward systems, but what they do in the brain isn't different from medical drugs. They're not doing something different. So, better drugs. Here's the fruit... Um, the, it's not a fruit fly at all, it's a vampire bat. Now, <laughs> uh, sorry, capsaicin, this thing that triggers our heat pain sensor, a vampire bat has evolved massively sensitive receptors to this. What would happen if it ate capsaicin? I have no idea. But instead of responding to painful heat, these respond to a little warm mammal in a cold field. It's produced a super sensitive heat sensor to find its prey. And we're going to end up with that fruit fly that we had right at the start. Fruit flies seek reward. They want a nice, comfortable, painless, cozy environment. But if you're a fruit fly and you're a male, the one thing you would like to do in life is mate. Fruit flies that fail to pull drown their sorrows by choosing alcohol over ordinary water. So the reward of sexual conquest failed, they turned to drink. And one of the interesting points about these club users is they said they don't worry too much about their intermittent recreational use of drugs, but alcohol, they feel, is a problem. So I'm going to finish there, and I'm going to say one other group of people have evolved. That's scientists. These are my research team. We've evolved out of white coats. I'll kind of thank them for giving me something to talk about, and thank you for coming along tonight. Cheers.